Hello! Oh wow, it's just all of a sudden I just looked up and the camera's so tiny. Hello! Welcome to Healthcare Triage Live! It's been a while since we've done this. I think this might be the second time since we were at NerdCon. I think? I don't know. Regardless, thank you for tuning in. There's so much going on in the world. Just in healthcare reform alone, there's so much going on. I would think we'd be inundated with questions. Bring them. Let's go. Um, we'll do some housekeeping while people start to show up and trickle in. Ah, patreon.com slash healthcare triage. We really appreciate your support. Anything you do, we appreciate. Um, it helps us keep the show looking so nice and help us doing all of this stuff. And it keeps the internet on even when it's twitchy. Um, Facebook.com slash healthcare triage. Check, check it out. Uh, HTTMerch.com. There's an old mug. That's all I say. There's the little... Uh, Badge thing, it's so cool, I actually use it every day. And then, um, you know, the lunchbox, the lunchbox is really cool. Whatever, buy it, don't buy, whatever. We appreciate anything you do. Anyway, why don't we get going? Jill Grandanny says, thoughts on collagen, oh, you're starting off with supplements. Thoughts on collagen supplementation either as a powder or a capsule form for a vegetarian. <sighs> what, for what, for what? Collagen. And even then, there's really, I don't know much good evidence that shows consuming collagen is what translates into making collagen. In the same way that eating fat is not what makes you fat. And eating cholesterol is not what makes you have high cholesterol, for the most part. Um, so my thoughts are that there's like almost no people or people with a very specific there may be some evidence, but that's therapy, not supplementation. Supplementation is, as always, this idea that if, if, like, if people are deficient and we give them some, then giving everybody more is good. That, you know, just because people without vitamin C get scurvy, giving everyone more vitamin C is good. That is so not true when it comes to vitamins and whatnot. You just are creating expensive urine and poop. Your body can't handle it, doesn't know what to do with it. Just because some sun is good doesn't mean you should be out in the sun all day. Just because you need some calories to survive doesn't mean you should eat as much as humanly possible. This supplementation is not necessary. More is not necessarily better. If you are deficient, then yes. And even in this case, I'm not sure that it's proven that that's the case. So I'm sorry for going on and on and on, but no, I'm not. I'm almost not. Oh my God. James Sasek, you're trolling me. I can see a question nine away and I know you're trolling. Anyway. Two, novel tie. Is there a publicly available tool which can calculate the Bayesian probabilities for various diagnostic tests? If not, is anybody making a public data set which could be used to produce such a tool? What an excellent question. So, I don't know of any good tools which do this, although that doesn't mean they don't exist. But what I do know exists and are easy to find are what we call like nomograms. They're these funky, and if I could pull it up somehow and show you, I would, but they're these funky diagrams which basically have a, in the middle, a list or a chart almost, it's some kind of scale of likelihood ratios. And if you don't know what likelihood ratios are, you should go watch our episode on, on sensitivity, specificity, and Bayes' theorem. But they show, you can find the likelihood ratio, and then what you can do is on the left side, I'm trying to get the left for you guys, which will be over here, on the left side, there'll be uh, pretest probabilities. And then what you do is you start at your pretest probability. Let's say you think you have a 60% chance of having something to begin with. And then you can draw a line through the likelihood ratio and wind up at the post-test probability. So it's a little handy thing you could have on paper. You could do with a ruler or pencil. You go, here's my pretest probability. You find your likelihood ratio. You draw a line, and that tells you the post-test probability if the test is positive and negative, depending upon your likelihood ratio. So that is a handy way to start with pretest, you know, what do I think the chances you have the disease? If you know the likelihood ratio of the test, you can calculate afterwards, what's the likelihood I have the disease? It's awesome. No one uses it. I've never seen a doctor in clinical practice actually use that. Um, when I train physicians and I teach evidence-based medicine, I show them that and I explain how it works. I've never seen anyone use it. But they, they work in that David Sackett book, that I talk about all the time in evidence-based medicine, there's even one of the like colored cards that's so useful at the end is the nomogram. You can probably find it by searching on the internet um, and that would be great. So there you go. Patreon, 
Is it just me or are medical issues concerning only or mostly women not researched as much or not taken as seriously and have fewer treatment options like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia? All right, I have two answers for you. The first is just a flat out yes. Um, I do think that there's a disparity on what is studied. Um, I do think that things that only affect certain populations are less studied. I think stuff that affects women. Yeah. I just did an episode a couple weeks ago on um, how like, a healthy lifestyle can improve cancer risk. And one of the caveats of that study was that like, while we now have like hundreds of genetic markers for an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, they're almost all in white people because we just don't have the same kind of markers in African Americans. That's a disparity. We don't do the research as much. We don't do the research as much in women. Now, when it comes to chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, it's a little more complicated than just that simple disparity because those diseases are those difficult to define. We don't have a test. We don't have a laboratory value. Um, it is very difficult to define the population and say these are the people that have fibromyalgia because it is I, it is difficult. It is, it is hard to define. It is hard to classify. It is hard to systematize, um, to operationalize. Um, look at me like a thesaurus there. Uh, so, so it's hard, which is one of the reasons that it exists. It's also that because we spend so much time trying to figure out how to identify it, it's very hard to figure out how to fix it. If you studies show that we can make a difference or that we know what to do, a whole issue with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, we did I was actually part of a study that just looked at hospitalized patients and kids a couple of years ago in pediatrics, looking at you know trends in even hospitalization for uh, reflux neurovascular dystrophy or RN. Um, so hard to define, so hard to classify. So that is true, along with the fact that probably you know diseases or conditions that only affect women are are less studied. Robert J. Down, one big selling point of the Republican plan is cross-state plans. Would that be effective? How would plans from Florida be effective in Indiana? That's exactly the This is a talking point that many people like to use that has no sort of basis in reality. I talk to insurance company executives all the time. No one wants this. No insurance, insurance plans right now, it is totally legal to set up plans to sell across state lines. Nothing prevents that. You can totally do it. The problem is one, meeting the regulations of every state, but even if you did away with that, no one would want those plans. Almost every single plan offered in the United States, with few exceptions, but almost every single plan in the United States has a plan in the network. When you go to those physicians, it costs less. When you go out of network, all bets are off. Less coverage, higher deductibles, higher out-of-pocket spending. Yeah, you have to stay in network. One, setting up those networks costs a lot of money and resources for the insurance company. So they aren't excited about setting them up in other states where they don't exist. Two, those networks are how they keep the costs low. By making a deal with the physicians locally, they can get a better deal on prices and then drive their patients to that and the physicians and the hospitals like it because they have increased business. When I, my plan in Indiana, which is excellent by the way, is for a specific network of Indiana doctors. No one in Florida wants my plan unless they plan to come to Indiana to get all their care. All the doctors they see in Florida are out of network. They're going to pay through the nose. Conversely, why would I want a plan from Florida or Texas or anywhere else? The only way to make a plan like reasonable is to have no network and then it's going to have skimpy, crappy benefits. Like, there, it makes no sense. No one wants this. No one. No insurance. These networks are the means by which private insurance saves money and I'm slapping the table and I can see Stan already signaling me and I'm sorry. Um, this is a great talking point. It, it makes no difference. It just doesn't work. It never has, never will. Four Los comments. Any advice for how to clear up an upper respiratory infection more quickly? See your doctor. If it's a virus, no, there's nothing you can do. If it's a bacteria you're going to treat with antibiotics, go see your doctor. That's how you do it. Jason Brunken, how much TV is bad for kids under six? That's like an impossible question to answer. So here's the thing. If you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, guidelines they'll talk about two hours a day of screen time and blah 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 and I know physicians who absolutely lecture you on how any screen time is bad and how you know TV is terrible and it rots your brain or whatever and I'm not convinced there's a causal pathway there yet um, I think that there's flaws in many of the studies I think there's a lot of them are associations and I think often like watching huge amounts of TV can correlate with bad parenting correlate with tons of other things which are unfortunately negative so um, 
but I will be honest with you, they don't watch a ton just because there's not enough hours in the day. Like, you know, they're just between activities and playing with them and doing stuff. They're just not watching a ton of TV every week. So it just was never an issue, not because we were limiting it, but because we had other stuff for them to do. I feel the same way about video games. We play some on the weekends. That's really all they get. There's no time. When would they ever possibly get anything else done? Um, so from a call, like, and also it depends on the kind of TV. You know, six-year-olds should not be watching adult television. They shouldn't be watching tons of crap, what I call crap TV in our house. Um, you know, on the other hand, there's stuff that is decent. I watch, I watch huge amounts of TV. I think I turned out pretty well. Um, I don't know how much better I'd be without TV. I don't know. So th it's, it's a hard answer. Um, but again, I would recommend talk to your pediatrician, get lots of advice, figure it out for yourselves. I think the quantity of the TV, I mean, what the kind of TV, the quality of the TV they're watching, whether you're watching it with them, is it, an, is, it an is it a chance for them to do something with you or do something, or is it just like they're wasting their time? All of these things matter. Pete Brunel, Brunel, just taking medication for symptoms, slow the body down from fighting a disease. All right. Well, okay, there are some medications which clearly will hurt your immune, look, I take a medication for my ulcerative colitis, which is specifically designed to hurt the immune system. It's an autoimmune, you know, it's, it's, that's what it does. It stops my disease from fighting me. So clearly some drugs can hurt the immune system and leave you more susceptible to getting ill, but that's not a side effect, that's the benefit. Um, chemotherapy is gonna do the same kind of thing. Lots of drugs are gonna do that. Steroids are gonna do that. But I think probably what you're asking is like, you know, does giving someone you know, a medicine to help their fever, like a Tylenol or an ibuprofen, um, to help with the fever, does that prevent them from getting better faster? The evidence shows that that's not true. Symptomatic care is fine. You do not get better faster if I don't give you the Tylenol or ibuprofen. You don't fight off the virus better if I do that. Um, that you know, now cough and cold medicines, I, I don't think they work, so I, I don't even see a benefit, let alone is there a harm, so I don't recommend them and I really don't really take them. I will take Benadryl or you know, diphenhydramine sometimes to help me sleep, especially while I have a cold, that's fine. Afrin works like a charm. Afrin's a wonder drug, but you should only use it for like three days, and I don't think that that slows you from getting better. Um, so there you go. So, uh, so I don't think. But again, talk to your doctor for specific questions. I'm not giving you healthcare advice. I'm not giving you healthcare advice. Mad Clan, your recent video about marijuana usage and its effects on IBS and Crohn's were the tests done on THC marijuana or CBD. So almost all studies of pot where they look at the benefits are THC and not smoking marijuana. Almost all studies where they look at the harms are looking at smoked marijuana and not THC. Almost no studies are done on edibles. So we don't have the answer. There aren't really great studies in smoking pot and how it affects disease. There aren't great studies on taking THC or edibles and how much it causes harm. But you know the evidence that is available is what we presented in that episode, which I encourage everyone to watch, and a lot of you already have, because making episodes on pot is clickbait for healthcare triage. James Sasek, and I finally caught up to you. How do I fix my gut bacteria so I'm not depressed? I know you're tweeting me because you just saw that study which was publicized in the media saying that the microbiome was related to depression and I lost my mind because I wrote an upshot column on this a few weeks ago. There'll be a healthcare triage episode coming soon talking about how the hype is overwhelmed. It's a study of some mice, and I'm banging the table and I don't care. It's a study of some mice and looking at stressing them out or screwing with them. They're genetically similar. They're probably all male mice. They look at the microbiome. They say that, oh, look, they're stressed because we put too many of them in the cages or we shot strobe lights at them. And oh, we found differences in the microbiome. Oh my God, there's a, no, that is not a study of human beings. It is not a study of causality. It is not a study of the real microbiome. It shows nothing in terms of treatment or changes. It is not a study of complex behavior. None of those things I, I cannot, I mean, literally, if they designed a study for the, for the ep upcoming episode to point out and say, this is, so now you've riled me up, sorry. John B., what are your thoughts on the Ben Goldacre book, Bad Pharma? It personally hurts my faith in medical research, and I'm curious how many grains of salt I should take a medical study with. 
We've talked about pharma and stuff before. I think Marsha Angel's books, the truth. Marsha Angel's book, The Truth About the Drug Companies, is another fascinating book. I think the drug companies do an enormous amount of good in creating drugs that are life saving. I think they do an enormous amount of harm to their own business with Me Too drugs and some of the marketing techniques. We got a whole series on orphan drugs coming up. We'll talk about some more of that in detail. I think Ben Goldacre is a great writer who is more is way more than he's not. Um, and people like him and John Iwanidis and many other people who are pointing out the crap in medical research, which we also just talked about seconds ago with respect to the microbiome, have a lot to say. Um, having said that, drug companies are not pure evil. They invent lots of good drugs which make huge amounts of difference in people's lives, me included. I have lots of friends that work for drug companies. I know people who work for a pharmaceutical industry who are in great scientists, great people who want to do well by everyone. So it's like you just you just can't, it's not black and white. They're the, the villains curling their mustache, it, they, it doesn't really exist. Um, so there's really lots of problems with medical research and everything else. You need to be aware of all of it, but it's not necessarily because people are. Realistically, how hard would it be to convert the US to a more Canadian single-payer system? It'll take two seconds, then you know you can write a bill, right? We'll just Medicare, expand it to everyone, we're out. That'd be it. Politically, getting that done, enormously difficult. As far as I know, there is currently one U.S. Senator who is in favor of that proposal, and he ran for president, and had he been elected, there would literally be zero presidents who are behind that kind of political change. I mean, zero senators, zero senators. So, you need like 60. I don't know how you do that. More than half of them are Republican. They're not voting for that, and a lot, even of the Democrats, more often than not, they're not supporting single payer for all. So, I don't know. I don't know how you get that done. Um, and then, how hard would it be con to convert it, like internally? It'd be difficult. I don't think it'd be as difficult as you know many opponents think. I mean, you know, it's been to do. By the way, when I got, was talking about networks and across state lines before, here's the irony: really, the only program that has no network and you can buy across state lines and is awesome is Medicare. Because you have Medicare and you can go anywhere. You can travel, you can go see the, almost all doctors are in network. Every hospital is pretty much in network. Every emergency room is in network. Every fucking you know, depending upon which Medicare Advantage wide network, Medicare, government plan. You really want to cross state lines? This would be a way to do it. Now my sarcasm is done. Um, Ma of the ocean. Ma of the ocean. Is it okay for me to share a water bottle with my dog on walks? She licks the opening of the bottle when I pour the water into her bowl. We just did an, uh, when I was at Nerd, an episode of, can I say the show? Holy, whatever. We were on an episode, yeah, we're an adult channel. It was the episode of uh, Holy Fucking Science. It was a podcast. I did it with Hank um, and Emily Grassley and I'm bad about it. In fact, I'm going to look about it, look it up while I'm talking to you. About this specific thing about the cleanliness of a dog's mouth versus a human's mouth. Um, the truth of the matter is that uh, dogs' mouths are filthy. Filthy! And because of that, uh, oh no, I can't. I'm gonna, I need to find this out. It's killing me. Hank. I feel and, and why can't I find this? Caitlin! I really do apologize, Caitlin. Um, I won't, what, did I screw up again? Okay, um, I won't forget your name again I, I'm, when I'm doing this, but I forget lots of stuff on the Anyway, dog's mouths, filthy. They're for a long time people, because all the studies showed that bites in, in the ERs that were done by humans were less likely to get infected by bites, were more likely to get infected were much more dirty than clean, than, than, uh, than, than, uh, than dog mouths. It turned out that it was almost all, according to the mechanism, almost all human bites that go to the ER are bar fights. When you Punch bite, very likely get infected. There are no studies of people punching dogs in the mouth. But I bet if you did, very likely get infected. Plus, dogs use their tongues as toilet paper. Humans don't. Dogs' mouths are filthy. Realize that seconds before you let your dog drink out of the water bottle, your dog was likely licking its butt trying to clean off its own poop. Or maybe it was eating a dead rat. Any of those things. Or maybe, like my dog, it was eating your other dog's poop and I don't know why you would let them put their mouth in there. Having said that, I watch people tongue kiss dogs all the time. I don't get you people. Dogs are filthy. She licks the opening, you're licking her poop. Own it. 
Tom Reed, thoughts about migraine treatment and why it's solvable for some but a chronic condition for many others. It's a chronic condition for everyone. Some treatments work better on, uh, than, on, for people than others. That's just, unfortunately, the way it goes. We have a number needed to treat. We know that some treatments work for some people and don't for others. In general, treatments work when they are more likely to work than placebo. And when it comes to migraine therapies, we have some, but that does not mean it drops it to zero. Nothing is 100% cure. Almost you know, very few things are 0% as well because there's always some placebo effect. I wish I knew the biology of why that was the case, but unfortunately, it just is. All right. Busy debt. Busy dad living. My three month, Caitlin Hoffmaster, I'm still feeling bad about that, I'm so sorry. Um, bad day living, my three month old has a monstrous placental birthmark in the back of his head. Maybe four square inches, all kind of raised and squishy. What is it with these things? It should stop growing, right? Most of the time, but there's no guarantee. You should talk to your doctor. Placental birthmark? Um, usually these things are hemangiomas. They're a collection of blood vessels um, that are just on, you know, too, too close to the the skin, they can get large, sometimes they can be treated with lasers, sometimes they can be treated with steroids, sometimes they can be treated in other ways. Very rarely do they get surgery, in fact it's very hard to operate on because they bleed. So a lot of times you just have to leave them alone. Um, now a lot of times as kids grow they do go away, but not always. Um, sometimes they can be treated. You should be talking to your doctor and not the guy on the internet like me. Um, so, so Joel Thorleafson. What are some of the shot is good and healthcare triage? And if you just consume, no, I'm joking, of course. Um, so look, there are, if you're asking me in general, I read a ton. I read the Washington Post, I read the New York Times, I read Bloomberg, I read Business Insider, uh, Wall Street Journal, um, Atlantic, The Economist, uh, New Republic, um, a lot of online sites. I look at Vox, I look at 538.com. Um, Stat News is good for health. Uh, Kaiser, all the Kaiser Health News stuff is great. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting important people who are really, uh, New York Magazine, um, I think John Chait, a couple other people right there are fantastic. Um, you know, online, CNN, MSNBC, I will tune into Fox just to see what's going on. Um, that's most of it, I suppose. If you're asking me specifically on health, it's a smaller, again, it's like, you got to find the people you trust. There's a reason that I make these videos and do it. It's because I hope we're a trustworthy news source for this stuff, for health research, for medical stuff, for health policy. That's what we do. It's what I do at The Upshot. It's what we do at The Incident Economist. It's what I do when I write for Academy Health. It's what I do for when I write for Job Reform. It's what I do here on Healthcare Triage. So there you go. That's mine. Doesn't mean it should be yours. But the bottom line is I read a lot and I look at a lot because I don't think anyone has a lock on truth. Um, and I like to take all of it in and then, you know, try to figure it out for myself. Kalua Girl, advice as a physician for nurses on how you'd like us to approach you to communicate our worries regarding patients at the hospital. To ask me this question means you're working with the wrong docs. I don't, I'd never understand. Just come and talk to me. I'm a human being. Just, just do it. I don't get that. I don't get, I don't get, there is no special way. Doctors are not special. They should be handled just like anyone else. If you find that doctors are unapproachable, that's a problem not just for you, but likely for patients and everyone else as well. That's ridiculous. And the nurses would just tell me. Now, granted, you know, in some specific cases, I'd be irked if, like, they called me at 3 a.m. to discuss a multivitamin. That could wait till the next morning, and I haven't slept. Um, but I think you'd be... Or if anyone called you at 3 a.m. about something which could wait till the next morning. But on the other hand, if you call them when, when they call me about legitimate questions for which I had to be asked, yes, if they call me because I had to like write an order and they couldn't, of course. If they call me because that's the legality of the situation, yes. Um, so without, with, with that very small caveat, just like any other human being. And if you can't talk to them like any other human being, that's their problem, not yours. Beckon Buttles, there are any truth to the set point theory? All right, what's the set point theory? Oh, with weight. Okay, yes. So this is the idea that like your body sets it and then it's very hard to change it. I mean, we don't have like randomized controlled trials, but I'm more and more convinced. There was that great article in the New York, I'm looking at Biggest Loser uh, contestants and how they did so well on the show and then almost all of them go back because their metabolism just slows so much. That is, and given our difficulty in changing our body weight through diet, yeah, 
Diet, not exercise. Diet. Um, there, there probably is some truth to that. Um, now, does that mean you can't change it or that people can't lose weight? No, of course not. Of course they can. So to just say it's this way, it's a hard and iron rule and it's that way for everyone, that's hard to say. So I think there's probably some truth to it, but I don't know that it's pure truth. Kevin R., is there anything that's been shown to be consistently effective at reducing hospital readmissions? Well, yeah, because we've done it. You know, we can make changes which make it less likely that people be readmitted to the hospital. I think better outpatient care makes it less likely. Being on top of situations, making sure patients have good follow-up, making sure they have access to drugs, making sure that once they leave, they're actually going to be able to do the things you need them to do to their care to begin with. Better discharge procedures that make sure the patients who are discharged are actually ready for discharge and have been given proper instructions and understand those instructions and have been given the tools necessary to do the follow-up and self-care they need to do at home. All of these things likely reduce readmissions. They're also all unequivocal goods and outcomes. That's great. The problem with it is that we set this as an arbitrary marker of quality without recognizing that a lot of the things I just mentioned are outside of the physician and the hospital health care system's control. If you don't have a car, it's very hard to get to your appointments, especially if you're poor. If you don't have access to pharmacy or like health insurance, it's difficult to get your drugs. If you, you know, are in some way older or have you know, uh, incapacities of daily living, problems with daily living, then, then it may be hard to do the self-care you need to. If you don't have the outpatient care that you need, if you don't have a good primary care doctor, or if the system isn't set up, if you can't do the follow-up, there's no appointment. A lot of these things are outside the hospital's control when they let you out. That's a problem. And so telling, telling hospitals, like, just fix all this, when so, many of, so much of what I just said is socioeconomic status, how are they supposed to do that? So using hospital readmissions as the metric is problematic, as we've noted in many episodes, as I've written about many times, as much research has shown. Having said that, it is the thing we choose. So people do work at it. One more question, and then I think we got to check out. Kevin O'Hara, what is the pulse in marijuana research and the current and future legal limitations on it? What are the repercussions of conducting tests in a legal state currently? So earlier, go watch it, it's clickbait, blah, 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 enjoy it. So there are lots of limitations on doing research. One of the limitations is that by federal law, you can only use pot basically grown by, by the fed, basically grown with the federal government's approval. It's like the University of Alabama or Alabama, somewhere in Alabama, one university has like a plot of land where they grow the pot. Christopher Ingraham, who writes for the Washington Post, has been on fire this week because they've taken some pictures of the pot that they're using for studies, and it is the most anemic, crap-looking pot you've ever seen. It's mind-boggling. So there's a limit on the amount, there's a limit on the quality, it tends to be low in THC, it tends to be not the stuff that people use, so there's there are all these, and it's difficult to get, so there are all these roadblocks to doing good pot research. Having said that, it's now legal in many states, as you just noted, and I'm sure that that means that some people could do research on that legally gotten pot. The problem is they're going to run into problems of peer review and the federal government. Um, because the federal government could invoke law to say it's not legal to do the research, in which case the journal may be skittish about publishing it, the docs or the researchers may be skittish about doing the research, and so even though it could be done, I'm not sure it will be done. Um, the Obama administration before it ended was actually loosening some of the restrictions on, on like trying to get more research done. I don't know if the Trump administration is going to do that. Given the politics of the current Attorney General and the Justice Department, it seems unlikely that they are going to federal pot laws. Um, and given sort of like who's taking over the you know the FDA and HHS and everything else, I don't know that they're going to change the rules and how much research we can do in pot. So I don't know that the fact that it is legal in a number of states is going to lead to more and better research. I wish it did. On the other hand. My gut tells me, as I've said many times before, someday they're just going to legalize this and then we won't, we won't even be talking about this anymore. Just like, just like docs used to write prescriptions for alcohol back during Prohibition, because medicinal alcohol was the way you could get it, medicinal pot is often the way people get marijuana. Um, we used to use alcohol for different treatments. We don't talk about that much anymore. You know why? Because people can just use alcohol if they want. I think someday if pot gets legalized, as it likely will, that is how we will discuss pot 
and this whole debate over medical marijuana will probably quiet down because people will just use it if they feel like they get a benefit and they won't if they don't. And that'll do it. Thank you for turning into Healthcare Triage Live. You know, continue. We're having it. We are, we are working furiously on an episode right this second um, on the CBO report and the AHCA. Hopefully, it'll be up soon. I'm not even going to say when because that's a huge disservice to Mark and Stan. But we've taped it. So it'll be up as soon as we can. Um, there are upcoming episodes and lots of interesting topics. Tune in on Mondays for our normal episodes, Fridays for our healthcare triage news, Wednesdays when we can for live, not next week because uh, they're busy and I'm out of town. Um, com slash healthcare triage if you want to support us. HCTmerch.com if you want to buy some merch. Check out offices everywhere else. We always appreciate your support and we love you. See you next time.